minutes and I'll speak about Indian banking in a time of change and uh, then we'll be happy to take questions and then of course my colleagues uh, Pramod and Sanjay are going to go further into what's happening. But I thought I'll give you the big picture of what's happening and it's a very exciting time. So I will talk about 12 trends that are happening in India uh, which are driving this change. So I, I'm not predicting those trends will happen in six months, one year, two years, three years. It's not a time issue. But all the trends that uh, I mentioned are fundamentally happening and uh, we can assume that they will happen on some time frame. The first trend is that financial services in India is going from low volume, high value, high cost to high volume, low value, low cost. And to think about this is it is a very fundamental structural change because the banking system historically has actually had very, has higher value but lower volumes. For example, a typical check in India is 75,000 rupees. A typical ECS transaction is 7,500. A typical debit card is 1,200. A typical mobile recharge is 30 or even lower. So the mobile has shown us that actually you can do high volume, low cost transactions and still make money. But the banking system has not shown that. So in some sense, the, the banking system that is operating in its own silo, which had these cost structures, and you had the mobile system, which was very, very efficient, 10 rupee recharge, 20 rupee recharge, Paytm, all that stuff. And fundamentally, both these worlds are now colliding. The entire banking system is going to go from this high, 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 high value to low value, but a corresponding increase in volumes. Sorry. The second thing is that sometime last year in Q1, electronic clearing overtook paper clearing. In other words, all the new forms of clearing, whether it was ECS, ACH, IMPs, etc., which is growing at 50% a year, that, and that is only going to grow. So the number of electronic clearing transactions has gone up. And we can safely assume that sometime in the near future, really the predominant, in other words, something which took 25 years in the United States is happening here in just 5 to 10 years. A great example of that speed is what's happening with IMPS. IMPS is a phenomenal product designed by NPCI, the National Payment Corporation of India. Just to give you the background, NPCI is a company, non-profit company, Section 25, set up and owned by the banks. Think of it as Visa and MasterCard before 2006. If you go back and look at US history, Visa and MasterCard were bank-owned cooperatives set up by Bank of America and others, and they were really run by the banks. And sometime in 06 or 05, they decided, oh, let's make some money, and they went and privatized both these organizations and lost control over the payments. So the fundamental challenge in the US is who the banks don't own the payments. But in India, the banks have created this company called NPCI which began by owning the ATM network, but went into other forms of retail payments. And the most impressive is IMPS. IMPS is essentially a 24 by 7 instant credit product. You can use it for remittances, but now there are many other use cases for that. I, now the total volume of debit cards in India is about 16,000 crores. The total volume of credit card transaction in India is about 24,000 crores, the total of both is about 40,000 crores. IMPS did not exist in 2011. Today, IMPS does 24,000, 23,000 crores a month of transactions. In other words, IMPS has already overtaken debit cards and is on its way to overtake credit cards. And by March of 2017, the volume on IMPS is going to be more than the total volume on debit cards and credit cards. This is in five years. This product didn't exist five years back. That's the pace at which adoption is happening, and that's uh, that's very important as we talk about the future of payments. So this moving from high volume, low volume to low volume, low value, high volume will be accompanied by lower transaction costs, and that's why the theme today is very important because historically we have treated market expansion and social inclusion as two different things. So market expansion was that the, uh, the, the financial service guys would go for the creamy layer, top 50 million customers, top 100 million customers, and the gov government would launch schemes to give everybody banking services, BCs, and you know, so small value accounts. But when you can dramatically lower the cost of doing a transaction, we can, you can dramatically lower the unit you know, value of a transaction, then market expansion happens. So in some sense, What's happening is that market expansion and social financial inclusion are coming together. And that's a very important strategic thing 
that you can think of delivering financial services for a billion people and still make money. And therefore, the market forces will drive this expansion and I think financial inclusion will essentially take care of itself thanks to market expansion. And uh, this is something very important to understand as we go forward. So that is number one. Number two, very, very important, that credentials, credentials are the base by which a financial service provider authenticates that you are the person you claim to be. Credentials are moving from proprietary to open. Let me explain. Historically, you have what's called as two-factor authentication. And the two factors of authentication are managed by the provider of the financial service. So if I'm a bank and I, sh I issue a credit card, I issue the card myself. I put it in a cover and put in a FedEx or a speed post and it reaches your house. And then they send you something else called the PIN. They put that in another cover, another speed post lands in your house. Average cost per card is some 200 bucks. If you lose the card, you can replace. Fundamentally, the financial service provider is managing the authentication credentials. Very expensive way of doing things. But you are now going to a situation, and this is the only place in the planet where you have the situation where the credentials are now going to come from two public factors. There's no one else. Right? The reason for that is it's fairly obvious that one public factor of authentication of credentials is the mobile phone. You possess the mobile phone, everybody has a phone, and that phone is what you have. The phone replacing the card is something that we understand. But in the first phase, you will use the card with the PIN. So the card will be replaced, I mean, the phone replaces the card, and the PIN continues. But in the second phase, you will use an Aadhaar authentication on your phone using either your fingerprint or your iris. And therefore, the mobile phone authentication is done with the mobile provider using an HOTP or whatever, and the other authentication is using a biometric, it is uh, checking uh, your identity. So, you are able to create two-factor authentication without getting into credential management. Which means two guys in the garage or in the KSR incubator can build an Apple Pay experience. Think about the implications of that, right? And I deploy it later, Sanjay? You have it? Well, let us just make it, if you don't mind. We'll just show you, if we'll take, we'll take time then. So we'll just give a demo of uh, how this works. So basically two-factor authentication, one-factor phone, second factor is Aadhaar. And this is not Science fiction, this is not something on its way, it's already here. And the device that we are going to show you is the Samsung Iris Tab, which was launched for $12.99 or $13.99 about a month back. If you, I know you guys noticed that on August 2nd, Samsung launched the Note 7. Uh, that has an Iris scanner. It's just a matter of time before that is other compatible. So fundamentally, these phones with Iris recognition is available for commercial use. Now the current model which is there is an assisted model. That means the camera is on the opposite side. So I, I use it to take somebody else's authentication. It's used by a BC for example to open a bank account. But the next, in the six months, nine months, it will be a consumer. In other words, the, the camera faces you. And you can do your own, just you can do a selfie. You can do a self-authentication. And you can do a self-KYC. And therefore, I can sit in my room watching TV and open a bank account on my phone without going anywhere else. So that's what's going to come. So the notion of having two-factor authentication on the phone, again, only place on the planet where you can do this. In the rest of the world, the authentication biometric is controlled by the vendor. So in the case of Apple, Apple Pay, Apple controls the iTouch. Apple Pay is controlled by them. They don't give access. Whereas in India, more and more phones, we expect Samsung is, Samsung is the pioneer. But we expect other people to also offer uh, the, this feature, so you'll be able to really have open architecture for two-factor authentication, right? Third thing is that switching costs are coming down. In other words, the cost of switching your provider of a financial service is coming down, right? What? Let's see what happened in the in the phone business. In the phone business. Switching costs are effectively zero, except the inconvenience of having a different number. You can just walk into some Kirana store and buy a SIM card, right? And 
When switching costs are zero, you typically have a lot of churn because there is no cost to switching, right? So today, in the if you look at what's happening in the uh, phone business, 85% of phones have a dual SIM. Dual SIM is an Indian invention. Try telling somebody in Helsinki that what is dual SIM. Yeah. One of the reasons why Nokia lost the game was they didn't, some guy could understand what is dual SIM, dual SIM and all that. So fundamentally with dual SIM, earlier what you do with dual SIM, you, you had one SIM for incoming calls and your second SIM was all the deals. Some new guy came, Uninor came or some uh, new character came, Raja gave a license, some other fellow came and he was giving a special deal. So you went and bought a second SIM. So dual SIM was how it started. Dual SIM also because different networks had different strengths. So I used Airtel in Bangalore, I used Vodafone in Chennai because the network there is better. But now dual SIM is a different way. One SIM for voice, one for data. So the same funda is now applied in a different way. So people are, 85% of phones are dual SIM. First SIM is a voice, so I, I take voice calls. Second SIM is my data pack and you know I keep it separate. Because I don't want the data pack, you know, I don't want that to come into my voice and so on. So all kinds of things happen. So fundamentally we have a very liquid market for telecom connections. Because of that, India sells 40 million, 40 million SIMS cards a month. Now, how many new customers? 2 million. So the total number of Indian customers is not changing. It's, you know, it has peaked at some 600 million or whatever it is. But every month, 40 million SIM card, but only 2 million uh, customers. Because A, that guy is buying the D, or because the retailer makes more money in selling a new SIM than doing a top up so you go and no SIM. So all kinds of things are happening. So when there is churn, you have a dramatic change. So 40 million SIM card, only 2 million thing. Today, with mobile number portability, there are 5 million mobile number portability requests per month. Which means in a year, there are 60 million MNP requests, which means approximately 10% of the customer base is changing their mobile number. Now, changing the service provider, They're keeping the number, but changing the service provider. So this is what is happening. So in other words, when you have a liquid market where cost of switching is zero, then, you know, just people start shopping around. Now that exactly the same thing is now going to happen in banking, right? You are going to have the ability to move deposits easily. You are going to have the ability to move assets or liabilities easily. And all payments will be interoperable. I will explain how. But fundamentally, churn is going to go up. Because you can switch very easily. Today, savings rates in India are deregulated. So, the typical savings rate of most banks is 4% on a savings bank account. You have a couple of banks like Yes Bank and Kotak, I think, who offer 6%. And your DBS bank, which is coming out of Singapore, offering 7%, right? Now, it's still a pain in the neck for me to close, the, close my account. But if I can close my account with one click, then I will certainly move my account from a 4% bank to a 7% bank. I'm sure Paytm will offer 8%. I don't know. So fundamentally, you're going to have churn going up and switching costs will reduce and churn will go up. Right? Uh, Sanjay, sir? Sanjay, you want to yeah, I'll just quickly uh, show you the device. Sanjay, you want to explain? Okay. okay. Anybody? Is there somebody with an Aadhaan for me? Don't think there's a magic trick where we're trying to fool you. Come, come on. You may think he's a stone we have planted, you know? <laughs> he's, he's a genuine guy. Come, come. You get your Aadhaan number. Huh? He knows his number. You know your number? I'm very impressed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's very difficult for them to believe I'm not right. Yeah, the first guy I went to actually knows his number. I like this guy. So, uh, so what I have here is a Samsung tablet. Uh, the tablet is uh, contains an iris device. The iris camera is at the back. And uh, I think uh, basically the, this is the iris camera. There's an IR LED here which uh, emits light in a certain wavelength that's used for the imaging. And I'm not going to enter a map here that can, you know. Huh? The plant. Huh? It's too obvious. Huh? It's a local thing. It doesn't go anywhere. Just. So he's given his other number.
just captured his iris, and there we have his EKY Okay, Shota. Thanks. Can start setting gun metal house, you have the address. Okay, so trend number four. Lending will go from uniform lending rates to individual pricing of risk. Because typically today, because of lack of data, we have a common rate for everybody, but once you have data, uh, you can actually price at the customer level, and that are the implications which I will come to tomorrow. So this is essentially because you have data from social media, mobile, web, this, that, and the other, and all, the, all of that can be used for individual pricing of risk. And very fundamentally, the lending paradigm will go from lending against assets to lending against cash flow. And that's very important because the moment, historically, the way banks lend, lend money, they lend against assets. But unfortunately, the bulk of people don't have assets which they can offer and so on. And so people who had to lend against cash flow are not getting money. Second, in a services economy, and as the other thesis that India will be domestic services-led growth with platformization. In a services economy, they don't have assets, but they have cash flows. So if you are able to get a model where lending is against cash flows and not against assets, then you can create a new cycle of lending activity. And that's exactly what you're going to see happening because of all this data that you will have. So lending moves from assets to cash flow and is fundamentally going to change the model. Second, fifth point is, the way that you make money will change. Because historically you made money from fees, but now you will make money from data. Now what happens when business models change? They disrupt markets, right? So in the, in the software business, for a long time, software companies sold software. So you bought a Microsoft license, you bought an Oracle license, you bought this. But what did Google and all do? They gave the software away. Google Docs, Google Search, Google Chrome, everything is free, Android, everything is free. Why did they do that? Because they said, we'll make money from data. And today, Google and Facebook own 80% of the digital advertising market. And therefore, the revenue model went from software to data and completely changed the economics of the software industry. And today, the market cap is always this new guy, $1.7 trillion between Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Network, Netflix, and Google. So this is exactly what is going to happen here, which is that banks relying on fee income are going to find that the new class of providers will provide transactions for free because the data they are going to get from that activity is, is monetizable. So the move is, so essentially you are not only going to go from high value, low volume to low value, high volume. You are going to have transaction fee trending towards zero. Because everybody will say, I don't mind making it free, but I will make money from the data. And this is a fundamental shift that is going to happen and has massive consequences for incumbents you know, if you are, today your business model is getting 3% on a credit card or something, you know, that, that game is going to go away. So fundamentally, you're going from fee income going towards to zero. This, all this has other implications. Is that the PSU banks are going to have a shrinking market share. See what happened in telecom. Way back 10 years back, P BSNL and MTNL were very strong. They had a big part. Now, they have lost... 70% of the market share in, in telecom because of the arrival of the mobile phones, Airtels and Vodafones and so on. See what happened in airlines. The national carrier lost 25% in four years. So when, when there is a disruption brought about by business model or by technology and, and the public sector unit is not able to respond to that, there is a loss in market share. Now the PSU banks are already losing market share. So this is the RBI figure, which is that they say that it will come down to 63 percent by 2025. But I would assume that with all this disruption, it is going to be faster than that. And therefore, the RBI is probably not estimating the impact of disruption on all this. And this is already reflected in the market capitalization of the Indian banking sector. The banking sector, HDFC Bank is worth 300,000 crores. SBI is worth 170,000 crores. Even though SBI has a book size probably six to seven times that of HDFC, all the PSU banks put together have a market cap of 180,000 crores. PSU banks plus SBU market cap 
is 350,000 crores, which is a little more than the market cap of one bank, HDFC Bank, a bank that began in 1994. So the market is already, in some sense, discounting the value of these companies. And a non-banking finance corporation, Bajaj Finance, is worth 40,000 crores. The value of Bajaj Finance is more than any public sector bank, save SBI. Right? And uh, all the four private banks, are the, you know, Axis, Kodak, and all that. I mean, Kodak is now worth more than Deutsche Bank. Think about it. So, 700 crores of all these four guys. Now, what this has major implications because if the public sector bank's market share is going to shrink, that business is going to go to private banks, NBFCs, fintech lenders, all these guys. Now, if India is going to grow at, say, 6-7%, depending on whose statistics you believe, and inflation is running at 6-7%, you're talking about 12-13% nominal GDP growth, and credit deepening because more and more people are now going to come into credit, uh, Economy, so credit grows at 20% with deepening, and then you have the reduction of market share from the PSU bank because this market going to come this way. So it's very safe to assume that if you have your act together, you can grow at 30% a year compounded in the next 10 years in the lending business. So it's a growth industry because of the peculiarity of the market, which is opportunities coming exactly at the same time that the national banking system is having its own problems with NBAs. So shrinking public sector market share is like de facto privatization. Actually, what you should be doing is privatizing these banks and let them compete. But you don't know that because oh, this will happen, that will happen, all that stuff. So fundamentally, they're going to become smaller and smaller. It's very unfortunate that that's the way it's going to be. Because if they had privatized these banks, then at least they would have captured some of the value creation. But it will be difficult now with all the problems they have on lack of capital, NPAs, this, that, government. CAG, CBC, CBI, XYZ, RTI, all okay, kinds of things. So fundamentally, this is what's going to happen. The next thing is that merchant models are ready for disruption. Right? Historically, what is a merchant model? You had some gizmo, POS machine, you issued the card. How do you make money? You made money from merchants, MDR, chalo, hit him for some uh, MDR, because you got the privilege of using my card. So, then you make money on the credit. credit. So what is the Credit interest rate on unpaid balance on cards, how much, how much do you think? 42%. So, you know, make money at 42%. So, that's the business model. That model is fundamentally flawed because there is no desire to expand the market. Because if you expand market, there's not enough credit, uh, you know. So, you need richer customers or you need people who can afford to have a credit line on the thing. And you need merchants with enough transactions who can pay you MDR. So, both from a customer perspective as well as a merchant perspective, this is a creamy layer business. It's only worth going to the top uh, merchants. That is fundamentally changing because cards will go with mobile payments. So basically the smartphone will replace POS machines on both sides of the transaction. The consumer will use his POS. Easy, easy time guys. So now, the smartphone will replace the POS and the card will replace the POS. So on both sides, I mean, the smartphone will replace the card. And using unified, pay, unified payment, I'll talk about that. Essentially, the whole thing will become uh, very simple. And going back to the principle that people will make money from data, people will stop taking transaction costs on merchant payments. So when Govind gives a payment at free charge, I assume there will be no transaction fee because he wants that data because he can go and you know, do something with it. So fundamentally, the whole transaction fee will tend to zero and essentially that will accelerate merchants coming into the formal economy because now they can do this and they'll all take a loan from capital flow. The next thing is cashless changes everything. Because all this activity is going to start making the economy cashless because everything will be digital, right? First is branches will become more and more irrelevant. What does a branch do? One, one theory is a branch required because you know, guys of my generation don't want to use devices so they have to go to a branch. That's the old versus young theory. But there is a big reason why banks open branches. Because banks collect, what happens is, I go and open a branch in, a, in Avenue Road or something, every evening, all the merchants of that 
and that makes a branch a lucrative business. That's why back and that's why all these guys keep opening branches. But suppose the merchants are doing cashless transactions. There's no cash flow come in the evening to deposit. Then what is the branch going to do? So fundamentally, the branch economics is going to go completely haywire. So similarly, with ATMs. Why do you need ATMs? They say, "Oh, we'll put uh, hundred thousand ATMs." ATM means you have to put one, you know, big thing. You need a guy with a gun. You need a CCTV camera. Yeah, wo, all kinds of things. Everybody is now an ATM. If I want money, I'll go to Raj. Raj has a lot of money. He says, "Boss, give me five thousand rupees. I'll give. I'll transfer five thousand rupees digitally to his account. He'll give me five thousand rupees cash for his pocket." Raj becomes an ATM. So fundamentally, everybody becomes an ATM. I don't need ATMs. And if I'm going to pay cashless anyway, why the hell do I need cash? So you know, but there's no reason to think about. Uh, ATMs. Similarly, you will finally see the long-awaited formalization of the economy because more and more people will enter the economy because being inside the economy is worth it than being outside. Because being inside the economy, I now become a recognized person. I have a digital footprint. I can use my footprint to get credit. All those things start happening. And therefore, if I am a bank and I say I've got so many branches, I've got so many ATMs. So what? These are all old style assets, and the new assets are fundamentally different. It is the phone in the hands of the consumer. It is data. It is platforms. It's algorithms. It's a very different ball game. So a whole disruption is going to come from that. And the good news, of course, is tax collections will go up as more and more transactions start entering the formal economy. Next trend: interest rates will converge. Today we have. Uh, Probably the widest spread of interest rates anywhere in the planet, right? So you can get a loan from a bank at eight nine percent, depending on who you are. But the informal sector is getting loan at five percent a day or something like that, right? So it's crazy. Still, I'm sure you are going to talk about it. So fundamentally, we have massive variation in interest rates. But as more and more people from the informal economy join the formal economy with this new platform. The interest rate spread, it says the range will will start coming down, and that has massive positive implications for the economy because it leads to economic efficiencies as informal IT comes down and becomes part of the formal sector. Trend number ten: Jandhan Aadhaar Mobile or Jan. Uh, Jan is the uh, Jandhan is the project to open bank accounts. More than 226 million bank accounts have been opened, and we can expect more and more bank accounts to be opened there. Aadhaar, one billion in five and a half years. Unique digital infrastructure. The Aadhaar system can do authenticate hundred million transactions a day today, and we only have ten servers, Pramod. Maybe twenty servers, so we can easily take this to a billion transactions a day. So it's all designed to be highly scalable. Only pl platform in the world which does online digital authentication. And then, of course, you guys know all about smartphones. Twenty-five million smartphones a, a quarter going to. For 700 million smartphones by 2020. So imagine a world where everybody has a smartphone, everybody has an Aadhaar, everyone has a bank account. What can you do with that? And all this accelerated by remarkable regulatory innovation from the Reserve Bank of India. I don't know how, how, how much of you guys know the history of banking and all that stuff. Unlikely, but anyway, India well, long before you were born. Indian banks were nationalized. Indira Gandhi nationalized 14 banks in 1969 and six banks in 1980. And from 1980 to 1994, no new banks were allowed to be opened. Private sector banking was banned. After liberalisation, 10 people got bank licences, including the aforementioned HDFC, who now work more than all the PSU banks. And then you had ICICI Bank, then then you had another two, which is Kotak and Yes Bank, and then you had two more about two years back, which is IDFC and uh, Bandhan. And then suddenly there were 21 new banks because the, Dr. Ram Rajan came out with this idea along with Nachiket Mohan about differentiated banking, small banks and uh, payment banks. And the latest thing last week, banks on tap. I can just go and open the tap and I get a bank license. <laughs> I know that happened, but anyway, the point is that. The regulator is bringing in competition by saying banking on tap. So any of any one of you with 500 crores can go and open a bank today if you are found to be fit and proper by the Reserve Bank of India. So fundamentally, regulatory innovation is also driving competition, right? Now, uh, uh, with this is happening the emergence of what we call as the India Stack, and the India Stack is a series of layers of things which my colleague Pramod will talk about later. But 
fundamentally it includes authentication, KYC, e-sign, which is to sign. I just launched a company yesterday which has e-sign, a locker system for storing documents, UPI, the payment interface. UPI is going live in the next four or five days. Uh, every day I call up Dilip Asmi and say what's going on and he says, tomorrow, kal kal ho jayega, kal ho jayega. So in another three, four days, you and Raj, how the software is working. Raj has built the software for UPI. So, software is working. Okay. So fundamentally, we have another, another, I think anywhere from 10 or more banks going live with at least four or five apps, including free charge and others. And I think that's going to be a revolution that we're going to see very soon. Because what UPI does is allows merchant payments to be smooth and therefore you'll migrate from, uh, you know, payments and hopefully end that evil thing called cash on delivery. So this is the architecture and I think I'll leave this to promote, to talk about. But fundamentally, we're talking how to make things paperless, presenceless, and cashless. And why this is important is that this dramatically lowers the cost of customer acquisition, lowers the cost of customer onboarding, lowers the cost of customer transactions. By an order of magnitude or more, it's not like delta improvement, it's 10x, 100x improvement. And that has a disruptive impact on every line of business and every uh, government activity. So this is why it is disruptive, it allows innovation, it's all no physical presence. I can do. I can do this while watching the match. It aligns market goals with social goals. It also increases trust because for the first time you have an architecture where you can combine real identity with a lot of data, and therefore you can you, you actually become trustable because you have real identity with data on on the system. And as people realize that having real identity with data gets them benefits, gets them a better job, gets them a better salary, gets them a loan then they have an interest in maintaining a good digital profile and therefore trust in the system goes up. So India will go from being a low, low trust economy to a high trust economy. So I think it's very important strategically trying to say what does that mean in terms of opportunities for business and, and so on. And the final point, India will be data rich, like real data rich. Why is that? One is mobile phones will be there everywhere and we talked about how Smartphones will become very prevalent, and of course, internet is uh, is going up. 331 million internet users. Mary Mika's last report said India is the only place where internet and smartphones are growing, and it's not just growing in Whitefield or HSR layout or you know where all the cool guys hang out. It's happening everywhere. So this is digital dish done by these guys from just you know now floats, and they're going well, around the, every six months. These guys go around the country to see what's happening. And they're amazed by the kind of adoption in remote towns and villages. Everybody's doing WhatsApp, everybody's selling flowers, Carpenter is sending his picture of the board to the customer. All kinds of things are happening. And fundamentally, it is being adopted in space. Everybody is going for this whole thing. Now, what all this does is that it creates huge digital footprints. Right? If those of you who grew up in the Feature phone era, you remember that there was something called VAS services. You remember VAS services? So VAS service was something, you know, you had to negotiate with a mobile guy and he took away 70% and he gave you some 30% and he shut you off and he didn't like your face. And there was hardly any data, there was maybe SMS and all that. Now with the Google Android permission system, there are up to 30 data sources that I can ask from an app. Obviously Facebook asks for everything. So, you know, you say I agree to some complicated thing and Hello. Take his location, take his this, take you all you guys also doing that. So fundamentally, the smartphone with over the top applications has dramatically opened up data at a massive level, which I can get with permission from everybody. And that, you know, is by inside the whole business model today of these companies is using this data. So that's clearly a multi-trillion dollar business. But even as India is going from data poor to data rich because of all this, machines are becoming smarter. Think about it. Both are happening at the same time. Data is becoming more and machines are becoming smarter at the same time. A good example is what's happening in vision. As late as 2011, 2011 was not that far back, the error rate of machines for visual vision, you know, for visual recognition was 25%. 25% was the error rate. Human beings was 5%. But sometime last year, machines became better than humans at visual recognition, right? So because of algorithmic work, everybody says machine learning, machine learning, all the AI and all that. Fundamentally, in every field, the algorithms are getting smarter and the error rate is going down. And this smarter algorithms is meeting this rich data, right? You agree? Are you guys worried or not? 
behind that is a company which is going to be the backbone of all taxes in India. It's called the GSTN, which I helped to set, put together in government. GSTN is the single place for all invoices. So every invoice paid by every company, every haircut and saloon, everyone is going to go through this box. And you're going to have 5 billion invoices a month. And you're going to have APIs, right Ramon? Machine readable APIs to say, I as a business, I hereby allow capital flow to take all my invoice details for the last 6 months. Get me alone. So fundamentally, when every invoice is on tap, 5 million invoices a month, look at the kind of data you're going to get. When Bharat bill payment system goes live in the next 6 months, 1 billion bills invoices a month, or I mean, in, in, uh, bill payments. So you know exactly how much the guy is, uh, you know, utility bill, phone bill, this bill, that bill. So suddenly, you're coming out of your ears with data, and you're going to have these fantastic algorithms. Think about what can happen. So we think that this will then be supported by a consent architecture because as, uh, let's talk about lending. Lending will become stronger because you have more and more data. So you'll have less defaults. Your consent tokens are not going to be shared. Today, how, how does, how do these guys, how do you guys get your data? You say, give me your username, password, go log on and get that PDF file. That is not going to be viable for the long term because there are a lot of risks. So fundamentally, it's going to change. And your ability to find out what's going wrong is going to be very, very quick. If suddenly you find these invoices are slowing down, you know the guy's sales are going down. If suddenly you find his AR is mounting, you know he has a problem with collection. So your ability on a real-time basis to figure out whether the company is doing well or badly is going to dramatically go up. You don't have to wait for five years and have 100,000 more NPAs, which is what we have in India. So fundamentally, the way lending happens is going to change dramatically and that scale is going to come. So what's the impact of all this? I talked about 12 fundamental trends which are going to change the game and I think you all agree with this. Obviously, banking has to change. Banking as a platform has to change, which means, I don't know, uh, you know they have to think of themselves as platform with partners. They, they have to think of themselves as data guys. It's very difficult for them to think of themselves as data guys. They have to be data guys. And they have to think of the customer onboarding, digitization, offering the right product. The whole architecture of our banks have to change, which is why it creates opportunities for new players because legacy systems are not going to adopt as fast as you would like. So, but fundamentally you have to think about how more data about the customer allows you to increase thickness. And fundamentally, data will be create risk arbitrage. Because lending, when you start getting to individual pricing of risk, the guy with the most data is going to win because he will be able to do a finer pricing and he can resell that loan and so on. So fundamentally, pricing will come from data and so will customer stickiness. And then you'll have alternate savings products as I explained to you how bank accounts will churn. And you have, for example, now you have liquid mutual funds. I can connect a liquid mutual fund to my payment bank account and put money and I'll get mutual fund uh, rates of return or I could have gamified products. I could, all kinds of the smartphone will be able to build many, many apps. So that, and I think Bala was talking about products. So getting these products right is very, very important. And uh, you know, saving pension product, all kinds of investment products. SEBI is now making it easy to buy mutual funds online. And then of course, lending. Lending is going to be huge. India faces some massive credit gap. And as we go towards database lending and all, it's going to be huge. And we want that lady on the street to be able to get a loan and not just those fat cats who run away to London. Right? <laughs> and you already see a surge. Alternate fintech lenders, there are only 32. Every day I hear on one. Every day I meet one guy saying, I'm doing alternate lending. So I don't know what's going on. So that, that whole thing is mounting. All of you are funding that. And we think that alternate lenders will have dramatically lower cost. And once they use the India stack, which Pramod will talk about, you'll have fuel for the reduction in cost. And you're already seeing new entrants with Pond Solutions, uh, Cabin Flow, Tindify, FedEx, the Bill Discounting. Uh, many of you, Phenomena is doing consumer loans for millennials. So all kinds of you know, firms are coming up in this space. So this is an estimate. This is not my estimate. You think I'm, you know, I'm selling you some dream. This is an estimate made by Credit Suisse. You're a Credit 
Swiss, right? So it's a Swiss bank. Credit Suisse has a very good set of banking analysts. And they became famous because they came out with this report called the House of Debt. Like House of Cards, but House of Debt. And they listed the top 20 business houses and their loans they owe to the Indian banking system. So House of Debt is a very famous report. So they have just done a report which says that the Indian commercial, the uh, consumer lending business is going to go from 600 billion to 5 to 3 trillion, 5 times. 600 billion to 3 trillion, which is 5x in the next 10 years. That's why I said this is the growth industry of, of the next 10 years. And then, of course, the payment inbox. UPI, again, you're talking about UPI, right? So basically, UPI, which is, which is going live any day, is, is, is a leapfrogging on payments. Push, pull, say, real time. You, you have virtual payment addresses. You have, uh, you know, all kinds of things, uh, notifications. The next version will have electronic mandates. The whole thing is going to change the whole business of payments. And anybody can offer this uh, product. Any, a bank and uh, vendor can offer this product. And of course, merchant enablement. Merchants will, today, if you become a merchant, it takes two months. That bank has to come, some device has to come, some certification has to happen. All that gone. Tomorrow, merchant en en enablement is going to be self-service. On the phone, I'll, I'll connect to the network. And merchants can initiate pull, push and pull transactions. So tomorrow, I go to the merchant. Uh, I buy, or buy something worth 5,000 rupees, the merchants can send a message to my phone, I can authenticate on my phone. So I never have to share my credentials with the merchant, or I can use QR codes, I can use NFC, I can use ringtones. I mean, we are, it's the whole UPI layer independent of the protocol underneath. So you can use any kind of protocol, you can use offline, all kinds of things. So fundamentally, all this will enable dramatic expansion in the merchant enablement. So you agree guys, disruption is waiting to happen and every product of the banking system is going to get disrupted, whether it's a bill payment, whether it's fast terminals, remittances, mutual funds, deposits, everything is going to change. And what is the size of the market cap? You guys are all about market cap, especially the VCs in this crowd. Market cap, today the market cap of the uh, financial services sector is about 180 billion dollars. This is going to grow in 10 years to 600 billion dollars. Now, who is going to take this market cap? Is it the PSU banks? Not sure. Is it the private banks? Not sure. Because the disruption is going to affect them too. Because if, if, if transaction costs go to zero and their fee income goes to zero, then a huge part of the balance sheet reduces profitability. Is it LBFCs? Perhaps. Is it the fintech guys? Possible. The guys don't know how to use data. I have not taken, I don't invest in this sector. So I have no bets. I don't know who is going to win. But one thing is for sure that with asset growth of 80% a year and market cap to asset ratio of 25%, which are reasonable assumptions, there is a 400 billion incremental market cap opportunity waiting out there. And it's going to be divided among all the players and those who are quicker, smarter, and better and also use the India stack. So this is your game. Thank you very much.